I've got a message that I think is going to go quick, um, but you never really do know, right? Go with me to Ecclesiastes chapter number three, and you can, you can hold your place there if you'd like. I'm going to read one verse and then we'll pray, um, but just go to Ecclesiastes chapter number three. How many of you know anything about warfare? Say amen. Amen. I mean, how many of you can honestly say you know about warfare? Now, I can go through the congregation and I can ask a lot of people if they know anything about war. But if they didn't serve and if they've never been in the trenches, if they've never had bullets shot at them or explosions going off around them, then they really don't know about war. There's a handful of people in this church that know about war. And sometimes as a believer, we think we know what somebody's going through But if you've not experienced it for yourself, you don't have an idea. I want you to understand that. And sometimes in the church, and I just feel led to say this, we get our eyes crossed or we get our spirits haughty. And we look at somebody that's going through something and we don't understand. And we judge them, probably prematurely. And we don't take into account what they've been through or what they're going through or the war that they're fighting in for their lives right now. So again, if you know anything about warfare, say amen. 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 Ecclesiastes chapter number three, verse number eight. The Bible says a time to love and a time to hate. A time of war and a time of peace. Everybody say that word, peace. Peace. Father, bless this, I pray. I'm asking, Lord God, that you would reach down and touch. If there is somebody here tonight that needs to hear this, Father, anoint their ears. Anoint my ears. To hear this word. Help us, Lord, to hear it. Help us, Lord, to digest it in our spirits. And God, help it to change our lives. Lord, we'll thank you for it in the name of Jesus. And everybody says, Amen. Everybody say, A time of peace. Now, in this third chapter, we're told, we're told some good news. And we're told some bad news. We're told from the beginning that there is a time and there is a season. We're going to read that that little portion of scripture here in a moment. But at the beginning, the Bible says there is a time and there is a season to everything. There is a time, which means there's an allotted space for every single one of the things that he's about to list out. For everything under the sun, there's a time. Understand that, say amen. Amen. There's a season. There's a time frame for everything. And when we read that and we understand there's a a time for, for love and there's a time for hate. Understanding that in the natural, physical realm, it implies that there's going to be a beginning and there's going to be an ending. And to that list, Solomon gives us, he includes some wonderful things. And then he also includes some not so wonderful things. Going back to that third chapter in the first verse, as I was saying a moment ago, the Bible says to everything. Everybody say everything. Everything. Everything that we face, everything that we go through in our life, Every tragedy, every trial, every victory, to everything, there is a season. There is an allotted time. Come on, somebody. 
and a time to every purpose under heaven. It goes on with verse number two, a time to be born. How many of you know that's, that's a good time? We always celebrate a time to be born. When a child is born, the family is there to celebrate. When a calf is born, the farmer is standing there to celebrate. Come on, somebody. When a church or a ministry is born, the people, they rejoice and they shout. Because be a time of being born is a good thing. We look forward to that. Then the Bible also says there's a time to die. Now, I don't know anybody really that looks forward to a time of death. Maybe in the right circumstance, maybe with the right situation with the family member then it would be something that you might look forward to but a time of death nobody really looks forward to that why because it brings sadness and it brings sorrow it brings grief and loss and we miss our loved ones whatever it is whether it's a loved one or a dog or whether a ministry dies it's always a sad time time to be born a time to die the verse goes on and says a time to plant <laughs> and a time to pluck up that which is planted. Now, I, I don't know what that scripture exactly means, but I would have to say if I'm going to go out in the field and plant a seed, it's going to be hot and I'm going to sweat and I'm going to labor and I'm going to invest money for the seed without getting a return. But then the Bible said, after you plant, there's a time to pluck it up. There's always a harvest time. And you're going to reap your reward and you're going to benefit. And I know that sometimes in this life, we feel as though we plant and we sow and we give and we take of our time and there's never anything coming back at us. But the Bible says, if you plant it, there's going to be a time to pluck it up. The Bible says in verse number three, a time to kill. Mm. Man, that's a horrible thought. But, but I, I guess if necessary, there would be a time to kill. But then there's a time to heal. Come on, somebody. I said there's a time to heal. What a great time when healing takes place. When healing in a, in a marriage or in a relationship or in a mind or in a physical body. It might be hard, but there is a time for healing. There is a time in which God has allotted for whatever it is. He knows how and he will bring healing to sick bodies, sick mind, sick marriages, sick families. God is still able to heal. And oh, what a time. Come on, somebody. I said, oh, what a time it is when God heals. The other day I was testifying about Brother Steve that came and he had a tumor in his stomach. They found out it was 22 pounds. He went to the doctor, but they, they gave him a report the other day. There's nothing to worry about. There's no cancer. How many of you would rejoice in that time of healing? Or when there's a husband and a wife on my couch and their marriage is about to be over, but six months later, they're walking hand in hand and God has healed what the devil tried to destroy. The Bible says a time to break. And how many of you know breaking down can be sad? Breaking. And there is a time to build. And I don't know about you, but building is always exciting to build something new a time to weep that nobody looks forward to and a time to laugh anybody uh, enjoy a good laugh say amen. amen a time to mourn and a time to dance there is a time an allotted time for for us to mourn but then there's another time that's allotted that's specified for us to dance a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. 
a time to get and a time to lose. How many of you would choose getting rather than losing? Say amen. A time to keep and a time to cast away. A time to rend and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. How many of you ever opened up your mouth when you shouldn't have? Come on, somebody. And how many of you didn't open up your mouth when you should have? There is a time for each one of those. A time to love and a time to hate. A time of war and a time of peace. Now, in that little portion of scripture, there's good and bad. But how many of you know that's the truth? There is a start and an end. To start something good is great, but it's sad for that to come to an end. Or the start of something bad is not so good, but it's glorious when it's finally over. Pretty simple, somebody see. And I can testify, I enjoy the good times. Anybody else enjoy the good times? You enjoy when things are going right. When you've got enough money. When you feel good enough to go to Silver Dollar City. We enjoy the good times. And we hate, I hate the bad times. And I love when the bad times are over and I hate when the good times come to an end. But the one I really want to look at for a moment is that last verse. A time for war and a time for peace. Everybody say that word war. It's never a good time to experience war. And peace is always so wonderful. But do you realize that the same applies to every believer? As we see it in the natural, there is what we know as war. Several wars are raging around us right now. In this world, countries fighting against each other. Down through history, there's been tribes that would go to war for territory. And since the dawning of time, mankind has engaged in warfare at one time or another. Just this past October, we saw a war begin in Israel. Israel versus surrounding countries and now it's Israel versus the entire world it started everybody say it started and it's still going but according to this text there will come a time when the war will cease I don't know when that will be it might be in the millennial reign there will come a time when that war will cease. A time for war and a time for peace. But I, I think about this verse in the context of a believer. Because whether we realize it or not, we are, everybody say we are, everybody say we are at war. We are at war. Ephesians chapter number 6 Familiar verse, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles or the tricks or the schemes of the devil. How many of you know the devil will come and wage warfare with schemes and tricks and plans, agendas? And the Bible said we've got to be strong in the Lord and put on the armor of God so that we can stand against that. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And I want you to hear, please, if you're not listening, begin to listen now. We are in a war. The adversary, the enemy, the devil, the kingdom of darkness, they hate us. Come on, somebody. 
They hate God. They hate the relationship between God and man. Do you realize we have something that the devil can never have? We have a relationship with the Father through the Son. So he is always, turn around and tell somebody always. I'm just trying to make sure you're listening. This is important to me. He is always constantly warring against us. If you left your house tonight and maybe everything was fine, maybe on the drive to this church, he started to war against you. Or when you're at work on your way home, he begins to war against your mind. And you walk in the door and you get in a fight. He's constantly warring against us. And if he doesn't use your work, he'll use your children. Or he'll use your grandchildren. Or he'll use the pastor. And he'll get inside of your mind and he will war against your thoughts. Come on, somebody. He will war against your flesh. He'll war against your spirit. He will fight you at every turn. Anybody else ever been there? Huh? I mean, you want to live for God, but there he is. He's warring against me. We want to do what God called us to do, but he's warring against us. There's people in this church that would, would love to be on the platform, being used of God, but the devil has waged war against you. There's people here that should be behind a pulpit preaching, but the devil is waging war. Come on, somebody. He's there fighting against us. And if you've ever been in the trenches doing everything you can do just to survive another day, let me hear you say amen. All of us have been there at some point to some degree. He fights against our minds. He fights against our physical bodies. He gets in our family. He gets between you and your children. He'll stir up trouble in the church. He'll fight your finances and on and on and on. Can I at least get a witness? So we all know about warfare. But let me ask you, what about peace? And that word, peace. I got to thinking about that today. Peace. The exact opposite of war. There's a time to love and a time to hate. Polar opposites. A time to plant and a time to harvest. Polar opposites. And when you think about peace, that's the exact opposite of war. Somebody say amen. amen. I got to thinking about that word today, thinking about this message, and I can honestly tell you, for the last several years, I've, re I've really known... I've not really known anything but warfare. And I look back and I think, where did this come from? I've, I've been in the ministry for years and had a little or relative warfare, but in the last few years, it's been raging against me. Anybody else? In some way, in some form, in some type of manifestation, warfare has been raging. But where is the peace? So let me ask you one more time. How many of you know about warfare? Say amen. amen. But then where is the peace? If there is a time for war which obviously there is, 
then there's also a time for peace. So where is the peace? Now, in the natural, and yes, in the supernatural, this concept is true in most regards. But we can especially look back at history. A war began like World War II. And then there came a time when that war came to an end. Is anybody hearing me? Now, there are times in your life when the enemy will launch an attack against you and it will be for a season, but then victory comes and that's finally over. But too often I'm afraid of this and I want you to hear me. Many believers never do experience or know the peace that the Bible refers to in the book of Ecclesiastes. We travel through this life, we go to church, we go through our motions, and we may ebb and flow, we may go up and then down, we might fight a battle and get a little bit of relief, but very few, I think, believers truly know about the peace that the Bible speaks of in Ecclesiastes 3. Because to us, are you still listening say amen? amen? And to our natural mind, everybody do like that and just don't do it too hard. <laughs> to our natural mind, and in every natural instance, peace that we know of is absence of war. But for the believer, if the enemy ceases his attack against your family, how many of you know he'll then begin the attack on your mind? Huh. And then as soon as you get through the attack on your mind, then it's an attack on your body. Come on, somebody. I mean, in the recent, in this past few months, I've prayed and I've gotten over it, and then there was something else. And I got to noticing that if, if I didn't worry about my left toe, then I started to worry about my right toe. And if it wasn't this, then it was that. And I realized the enemy is continuously raging against us with warfare, trying what? His purpose of warfare is to bring destruction. I want you to understand tonight, those people that attacked Israel in October, they didn't go in there to make a fluffy little sign no, they went in there to bring destruction and devastation. And that's exactly what the enemy wants to do. Whether it's your right toe or it's your left toe, he's going to continue to wage warfare against the child of God. So since our war is not against flesh and blood, now that's, it's, it's not in the natural sense. If, if I were fighting Brother Mike Acker, there would be a time when that fight would be over. Probably with me standing there. No, I'm just joking, Mike. <laughs> but since it's not flesh and blood, it has nothing to do with Mike. Now, the enemy may be using him, or he might be using me against him. But it's really got nothing to do with that man, that flesh and blood body. No. The Bible says our war is not against flesh and blood. And since it's not against flesh and blood, there is no real ceasefire. Right now, they're trying to talk to Israel and, and agree on a ceasefire so they can get humanitarian aid in. But in the spirit realm, there is no ceasefire. Come on, somebody. There isn't a time when the enemy's not coming at you. Hallelujah. There isn't a season when the principalities call up the rulers of the darkness and then they check with spiritual wickedness and they decide we're gonna take a day off. We're going to give them a break today. Come on, somebody. 
No, you, you get through the principalities and then you've got the rulers of the darkness of this world and they're constantly ganging up on you and constantly bombarding you. There is no ceasefire. This war that rages between the enemy and the believer is constant. It doesn't stop. If you're not careful, you'll get up from the altar and be mad before you walk through those doors. Or you might get to the car, but you'll be mad before you get to the street. It never stops. It never slows down. It may change or take on another form, but you, you may get over one battle, but then condemnation sets in. I've been there before. And then you might get over condemnation, but then something begins to hurt. And then you might get over that, and your spirit comes under attack. Is anybody hearing what I'm saying? We are in a state of constant battle. So what does that mean? Ecclesiastes 3 doesn't apply to us? If I, does it not apply to our spiritual situation? I believe it does. Let me explain. The believer, anybody here tonight a believer say amen? amen. A believer who's always faced with warfare that rages from the pits of hell can know war, but they can also know peace. But spiritually, the war never does end. And that means neither does the peace. The truth is, we are at war today. Anybody in war today say amen? I mean, really, are, are, you, in the, are you in the trenches? We're at war today. We were at war yesterday. And we're going to be at war tomorrow. That has not and does not change. Unless that is, the war comes to an end. And I can tell you, there's coming a day when the war is going to come to an end. When we leave this world in the rapture of the church, or we go by the way of death, there's going to come a time when we walk over that Jordan River, and we're going to shout glory to God, and we're going to give praise to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Say, but you just told us that war never does end. It does not end in this life. It doesn't end in its efforts. So what I'm saying is that hell does not stop trying. So let me explain. I'm going to take you through several scriptures. You can get your Bible out and follow along, or you can read it up on the screen. Romans chapter number 8, verse number 6. And after I read through this and I, I had got to thinking about this later today, this is monumental. Romans 8 and 6. Everybody got it? Say amen. amen. Everybody listen and say amen. amen. For to be carnally minded. So what does that mean? To be carnal, fleshly, natural minded. The Bible says to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life. Carnally minded, being carnally minded works death, which I would equate that with war. A carnal mind is always in a state of war. Everybody follow me? Say amen. amen. But to be spiritually minded, to have the mind of Christ, to have a mind that is renewed, the Bible says is life. And I would equate that with peace. So if I've got a carnal mind, then I'm going to always see things through carnal eyes. And I'm going to try to, are you following me? And I'm going to try to do things through carnal means. And I'm going to apply the flesh to every aspect of my life. I'm going to look at my family through the eyes of flesh because I'm carnally minded. And if I do that, I'm going to be at war. And I'm going to look at my situation. I'm going, to, I'm going to go through the things of this life and I'm going to do it, listen, at war. But to be spiritually minded. How many of you can say you're spiritually minded? Say amen. Spiritually minded brings life. Or you could say 
it brings peace. Because now I'm not seeing the situation in my family through carnal eyes. I'm looking through the eyes of faith. I'm not seeing my sick body through the natural eye when they say there's no hope, but I see through the eyes of the word and the Bible said there is healing for every sick body. Come on, somebody. So when we're at war with our carnal mind, we're not sure how it's going to turn out. Man, I've been there. Anybody else? When we're carnally minded we're not sure how it's going to turn out we're not sure what's going to happen we're, we're wondering is god going to bring me out of this i've been there carnally minded and that carnal fleshly mind it works death in us or you could say it works war in us come on somebody i remember often in my life the the doctor would come out and say something about michelle or one of the children and during the time when i was spiritually minded i heard it with faith ears and i could see already how god was going to bring this about but then other times I, I maybe wasn't in the word or my prayer life wasn't quite right or I was off in my trajectory towards Jesus and I heard it with carnal ears. And then I saw it and thought about it with a carnal mind. Is anybody hearing what I'm saying? I pray to God that you're sitting there right now and you're thinking to yourself, no wonder work looks so bad. No wonder that marriage looks so hopeless. No wonder I cry so much about my children. You've been looking and thinking with your carnal mind. Therefore, you've been at war. And in every circumstance, a carnal mind will bring into question how this is going to turn out. Ever met any one of those believers that it didn't matter what happened, that say, they'd say, God's going to work it out. Well, I mean, like your whole house burned down. Well, God's going to work it out. Listen, that's not fake. That's spiritually minded. That's peace. Come on. To be spiritually minded is to know the plan of God. Huh. To trust God with all of our hearts. To know the word and to be filled with the spirit and, to, and the spirit to bear witness with ours. How many of you would agree that's peace? That no matter what you're in, no matter what happened, no matter what the devil said, that you have peace. So he is constantly waging war, but right in the middle of what the devil's trying to do, you are spiritually minded and you've been given peace on the matter. Somebody, if you want God to give you peace, say amen. amen. Saying the same thing again, listen, Romans 14 and 17. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. It's not physical, it's, it's not carnal or natural but righteousness and peace. Everybody say peace. And joy in the Holy Ghost. The kingdom of God is spiritual and it's peace. This earthly natural realm like the food and the drink that the Bible refers to, that's natural. And it brings, out, it brings about warfare. But the kingdom of God, it's peace. It's spiritual peace. Let me ask you, is there a war raging? Of course there is. But we can have peace because we belong to the kingdom of God. Amen. Romans 15 and 13. Now the God of hope fill you with all peace, joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. Goes all the way back to that first scripture. 
To be carnally minded, you're going to be at war. To be spiritually minded in the kingdom of God, then the ruler of heaven and earth will give us peace and our joy will abound in the power of the Holy Ghost. Romans 15 and 33, I have several, so just bear with me. Now, the God of peace. Everybody say peace. peace. Be with you all. Amen. 1 Corinthians 14 and 33, for God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. Get that, all right? If there's warfare and if there's confusion, God's not the author of that. It's the enemy. Because our God is the author of peace. Peace in the midst of war. Amen. Ephesians 2 and 14. For he is our peace. Amen. Who? Jesus. Amen. Now remember Jesus said in John 14 and 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth. Giveth I unto you, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Anybody in the midst of warfare, your heart was troubled? Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. Man, man, I know I've been there. Have you? But he said, no, don't let your heart be troubled. Why? Because he is our peace, and he gave us his peace. And he said, don't let your heart be troubled. Be at peace. Have peace in this world. Philippians 4 and 7. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Now, I don't know about you, but in my mind, I get a picture of a soldier down in the foxhole and they're raining bullets and they're raining bombs on top of his head and he's laying there peacefully at sleep. Is anybody here? I get a picture of that in the word when the Bible said Jesus was in the boat and they were, they were rocking and the waves were crashing and the lightning was flashing and the wind was blowing and they ran back there and they said Jesus and they found out he was asleep. Why? Because he had perfect peace. It didn't make any sense at all to be asleep on a boat that was rocking in the middle of a storm, but Jesus had peace. And the Bible said he gives us that peace that passes all understanding. Mm. Colossians 3 and 15. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts. May I ask you, what's ruling your heart? Is it the fear, the anguish, the anxiety? Is it the situation? What's ruling your heart? Because the Bible says, let the peace of God. When I read through this, and I could go on and on, the truth is a believer will always be in a, in a state of warfare because the enemy never will stop trying. But we can always be in a state of peace. I said we can, no matter what happens in this world, no matter what they say tomorrow, no matter what the news reports on, we can be in a state of peace when we know who God is. Does anybody know who he is? Shout amen. When we know what God can do. Anybody know what God can do? Say amen. When we know what God has promised, when we trust him, when we know that everything's going to work together for my good, then it doesn't matter the warfare that's raging because I'm in a state of peace. Somebody say praise the Lord. Then and only then can we be at war, but at the same time be at peace. I close with this. Turn with me in your Bible to Psalm 91. I just want to read a few verses. Psalm 91 and 1. I love this. It speaks to exactly what I'm saying. There is an adversary out there raging against us. But it says here in verse number 1, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High God. What's the secret to being at peace in the midst of war? 
dwell in the secret place. And I believe that secret place is Jesus Christ. And when you put your faith in him, and the Bible says we are then in Christ and we're seated in the heavenly places in Jesus, then the war can rage around us, but I'm at peace. Shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Then in the midst of warfare raging, he said, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge. Why would you need a refuge unless there's a storm? He is my fortress. Why would you need a fortress unless there's an enemy? My God, in him will I trust. Surely he hath, he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. That means you can walk through a minefield and you can be at peace knowing that God's going to deliver you and God's going to spare you and God's going to bring you out on the other side. He shall cover thee with his feathers and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in the darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. So they'll, they'll, there, there will be warfare on every side, in every direction. People will be falling down to your left and to your right. But the Bible said when you trust in God, when you're in that secret place, it's not going to come near you. That means you can have peace in the midst of the war if you will trust that God knows what he's doing. Hallelujah. If you would, sis, come to the piano. Number one, this message means a lot to me. But I want this message to mean a lot to you. Because I want the people of God to be at peace. Right now, In this building, no doubt, there's people that are in the foxholes. You're in the war. You may be battling for your soul. There's peace in the midst of that battle. Turn to the Lord and cry out to him. Remember who he is and what he can do and what he's promised. Remember what he's already done. I promise you, if you'll search for the Lord, if you'll seek him with all your heart, he'll give you the peace that passes all understanding. Edge about it real quick, eyes closed. If this message, I pray that everybody heard it, that you received it. But if you're here tonight and maybe it was a little bit for you, my hand is up. Would anybody else want to join me? God sees those hands. You see, this message was, in some way, it was for me. Hallelujah, Jesus. I invite you tonight, if you'd like, come to this altar, find a place to pray. Bow your hearts before the Lord. Maybe get up out of your chair and come do it. That would be great. Just come on down to the altar and bow your heart before the Lord and ask God to give you the peace that doesn't even make sense ask God to let this word take lodging in your heart that you'll go home and he'll continue to produce fruit from these words God bless you as you come